Hello, hello, and welcome to Pints with Aquinas. My name is Matt Frad, and today uh, I'm really excited because I'm going to share uh, with you these these three. I say share. We're going to have three young men, three young male college students on the show who I met in Austin just a couple of weeks ago. And when I was there, they said to me that uh, they started a Bible study last year in part to sort of convince themselves that Catholicism was false. Well, as of today, they are all Catholic. And so we are going to be hearing their story. Now, let me just kind of address a couple of things before we get going. Um, I have conversion stories like this quite often on the show. And it's been interesting to me of late, there's been a number of people who've accused us of sheep stealing. And I think by sheep stealing, what they mean is trying to make people Catholic. So if that is what they mean, (laughs) <laughs> yep. Yeah, that, that is absolutely what I'm doing. But of course, stealing implies that the other had uh, little or no say in the matter. And obviously, nobody's about forcing people to become Catholic. Even the Catholic Church says you can't force people to become Catholic. Uh, how about sheep persuasion? About helping people outside of the Catholic Church become Catholic? Yeah, that is what this is about. Now, um, I'm really excited because me and a couple of friends have founded um, an apostolate called Cross the Tiber. Now, this is a really cool website. I want you guys to go to check it out. I've got a link in the description below. Basically, if you are a you know, Protestant or an atheist or you're outside of the church, but you really do have serious questions about the Catholic Church, what do you do? We founded this community so that you can join for free, and you will join a small video chat group of other people who are considering becoming Catholic. You can ask your questions, you can offer your objections, and each group will be headed up by, you know, a a Catholic that we choose who's knowledgeable in the faith and charitable. You know, this is not about making anyone feel bad. This is not about being judgmental. You know, we, we just, we just, this is a charitable exchange between people who are not yet Catholic who want to cross the Tiber. And the Tiber, by the way, is that river between Rome and the Vatican. Uh, so go check it out, crossthetiber.com, if you are a non-Catholic considering uh, becoming Catholic. And again, there is a link in the description below. Okay, so let's uh, let's see if we can do this. This is the... Hey, you going, guys? This is the first time I've had four people on the show. Uh, I guess I'm one of those people, but good to have you. <laughs> Yeah, glad to test out. Thank you so much for inviting me. You got it. Look, before we delve into the discussion, could I have one of you just sort of sum up what has taken place, I guess, over the last year or so? Sure. Yeah. So starting out a little over a year ago, um, there's a a fourth member of the Bible study. He couldn't be here today. Uh, His name's Kaysen. But we all got together after meeting each other in just uh, really interesting ways. Maybe we'll get into that more when we talk about the the establishment of of our Bible study. But uh, we all started a Bible study in pursuit of truth. That was the goal. We knew that where we were, we did not know what the truth was, and the church we were at did not have the truth. So that was the mission of the Bible study. And along the way, we were going to, you know, disprove Catholicism because to us, it was obvious that they did not have the truth either. Um, And so, yeah, eight months later of studying and reading and having some very lively debates on our uh, faithful Sunday night meeting, um, we all consequently converted, all four of us, to Catholicism and uh, were welcomed into the church last Easter. That's wonderful. Jack, was it a Bible study just containing you four? Um, it, we were essentially the backbone of the Bible study. We had people from our current church come in and out. And then later on, we had people from, you know, Our Lady of Wisdom here in uh, San Marcos, Texas, which is the the church we were all welcomed in at. Um, they began to come just to see, oh, wow, you know, uh, these Protestants are interested in Catholicism. Uh, let's let's talk to them. Let's have some more uh, interesting thoughts come into the debate. Okay. Um Share with me, because it doesn't sound, it, it sounds like you were um, dissatisfied with whatever church it was you were attending. You knew that there was more somewhere else, which is partly why you joined this Bible study. Um, maybe somebody could tell me, you know, what it was that you found you know, unsatisfying in the church you were at, why you knew it wasn't the fullness of the truth, and then just kind of lead us through maybe this this Bible study. And Nick, you want to go ahead and start so. with the, yeah. Yeah, so how it started, um, to answer your first question, 
really what was bothering us uh, about our former church was um, at the time what we considered lack of biblical truth that we saw being preached from the pulpit. Um, we all come from varying degrees of Protestant belief, but all of us would probably have considered ourselves Baptists. Myself, I would have considered myself a fundamentalist Baptist at the time. And so the church we were all going part of, we just didn't see to have like authentic biblical teaching. And as Protestants, um, you know, the Bible is the only thing that we have. And so we want to make sure that it's we're, it's being faithful to, the teaching is being faithful to the scriptures. And so we, di we didn't find it to be satisfying. And so um, I very much so was upset and confused at the teachings that were, I were getting. I'll give you one quick example. Um, there was one week where um, from the stage, it, to give a little context, this was a pretty hyper charismatic church, which is kind of weird coming from a fundamentalist. You might ask, why was a fundamentalist going to a charismatic church? But one week we heard from the stage that while Christ was on earth, that he at a time ceased to be fully God um, and did most of his miracles mainly in his humanity for the sole reason to prove that we, through our humanity, can do miracles as well. Um, and so we found these teachings to be truly disturbing. And so that pushed us to desire to create some form of a Bible study uh, with two goals. The first goal being, what is truth? We want absolute truth. And then the second goal being, we want an end of sin in our lives. We want to get rid of it. Excuse me. Okay. If I was in your position... I think I would have just said, okay, there's bound to be a more orthodox Protestant church nearby that can more faithfully expound the scriptures. Did you look into that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, I guess to jump back, how it all started, at least for me, to give like a quick summary of kind of where I was coming from, I was baptized in the Catholic Church when I was an infant, uh, when I was about three months old. But then three months after I was born, um, my parents decided to, for varying degrees, leave the church, and I was brought up in a non-denominational church. And being brought up in a non-denominational church, uh, it was good. I learned much of what the scriptures teach, things like uh, Bible memory verse contests and sword drills, if any of your audience is familiar with those. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was very common. And so the Bible was everything for me as a, as a child. And um, I had just a natural love of theology that from, from a very young age that separated me from a lot of my fellow, um, from my you know, people my own age. And through that separating, um, I always felt like somewhat distant from everybody. Um, so growing up, I, I very much so wanted to do the right thing and to follow the Lord the best way I knew how. The best way I knew how at the time I, I reasoned was, well, maybe I should I should become a pastor. Maybe I should go and pursue a pastor. But as I'm reading the scriptures and uh, contemplating their meanings and uh, doing my own survey of church history, I find a sense of pride started to build up within me. Uh, you could say almost a religious pride of saying, you know, I think my interpretation of the scripture might be the only one because I'm looking around at what the scripture says and I'm looking at what's being taught and I don't see them matching up. And so very much so from the beginning, um, when we decided to leave this former church, it was, I think, for at least myself, uh, that old sense of pride that was wanting to come out. And very much so it was just like, I don't know who I can trust. All I can trust okay. is my Bible by myself. Oh, interesting. I see what you mean. Yeah, so you mm -hmm. may, it, it sounds like you were so disillusioned at this point from the false teaching that it wasn't enough just to kind of jump into another, say, more orthodox or more conservative, I should say, uh, Protestant mm -hmm. church. You wanted to get back to the Bible to see what the Bible actually actually taught. Sean, uh, tell us a bit about you. Like, uh, What was your background, and why did you enter this Bible study and, and, and all that? <laughs> Um, so I'm probably the most skewed, like, of joining the group because uh, I I grew up I grew up Baptist. Uh, my dad was actually a, a Southern Baptist uh, pastor for a time, um, and I was growing uh, disillusioned as well to um, to Protestantism just because, like Nick was saying, it was very much so me and my Bible. Um, I didn't know how to properly form exegesis on scripture or um, know where tradition laid because uh, just like 
various things weren't lining up with what I believed and what the church fathers believed. Um, and the way that I came into the Bible study was uh, just randomly and passing only, only probably talking to Nick a handful of times. Uh, he invited me to this Bible study and the night that we decided to, or they decided to meet up to uh, talk about the founding of the Bible study. They were going over different Calvinist beliefs at the time. And uh, I had just uh, started getting into uh, this idea of Calvinism uh, and uh, knew where to find them in the scriptures. And so mm-hmm. what they thought would be off-putting was actually, uh, I, was un- I was being sympathetic to their view because of their scripture. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Jack, did you want to jump in? Sure, I'd love to. Yeah, this is such a good story. I, I love telling it. But um, <laughs> me and Nick had met at the church. We were we were both tending. Um, all four of us were going to the same very charismatic church, and all four of us were you know going through the motions. But it, it, internally, it was just not something that was feeding us. Um, and so me and Nick were the first two to meet and I actually met Nick. Uh, this is a, don't, don't evangelize like this. I I don't recommend it, but for, for me and Nick, this very special circumstance, it worked very well. So me and Nick became best friends over about a six and a half hour conversation where, uh, he asked me how I was doing. And I very coyly said, Oh, I feel like God's really proud of me right now. And then Nick, being uh, hyper puritanical at the time, um, <laughs> proceeded to absolutely. Uh, we went through an entire uh, analysis of First John and why there's no possible way God could be proud of me. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, after that, we we kept hanging out. We we became best friends over over that experience. Um, and continuing on, we both just uh, all four of the Bible study members existed in this place where. You know, we were told we were free from sin and that we should be free from sin. And we weren't. Um, it, it was like this sense of, you know, everyone acting as if they're already in, you know, let's say if you're trying to drive somewhere and everyone's texting each other and everyone's acting as if they're already there and no one's there. Um, mm. But you feel like you need to be there because you feel like everyone else is there, but you have no gas in your car. And you can't get there and you can't find anywhere to get gas. And it was very much that sense of just superficiality when it came to anything spiritual. Um, and so that was that was my experience. Uh, I, I remember sitting in a very dark, smoky room um, with very loud you know, worship music playing. Uh, and then all of a sudden, Nick, out of the corner of my eye, comes up. And this is before I met Nick. Um, he just comes up to me. And for some reason, he knew exactly what I was thinking. And in the most, you know, Darth Vader way, weird way, he goes, it doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs> and I looked at him and I was like, how do you know what I'm thinking? No, it doesn't make any sense. Um, I, I don't know. You know, this just doesn't, this is not having an impact like it should be having an impact uh, in my life from from what, you know, God should be. Am I really experiencing God right now? Um, and so, yeah, that was kind of the fundamental push to start the Bible study was we were not satisfied, you know? And so, uh, starting off, it it was that, that tenant of, man, you know, what, what really is the truth? Because, uh, we know that, you know, God exists and we want to have a relationship with him and we want to have some form of intimacy with him. But it was just, yeah, it was, it was very, uh, it was just desolate where we were. I, I love how your friendship began. It could be summed up as Jack being like, I'm awesome. And Nick going, you're disgusting. And Jack being like, let's hang out. <laughs> that's, that's almost Very exactly accurate. what began. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so, yeah. I mean, being disillusioned with one's church is one thing. Um, you know, going to the scriptures to seek answers is another thing. Deciding from those scriptures that Catholicism must be the church that you go to is, I mean, that's a whole other thing. I'm, you know, like I know many Protestants uh, who, well, I, I know some, ca- I know some Protestants who are better Catholics than many Catholics I know, if you know what I mean. You know, they they <laughs> love Jesus Christ, they love the scriptures, they're trying to be faithful to to the scriptures. So, I mean, if somebody had have told you at the beginning of this Bible study where you guys just felt like unsure, hey, just so you know, you guys are going to be Catholic next year. I, I want to know what each of you would have said to that. <laughs> I would have said, uh, you're a false prophet. Get out of here. Really? 
<laughs> Sean? Um, I would have uh, laughed at their face and, and politely said that that was a funny joke. Jack? Yeah, uh, I was raised um, dogmatically, and like I wouldn't say anti-Catholic, but pretty, you know what, I will say anti, I was, that's how I was raised. Um, and so if someone said that to me, I, I, I would think that they would be playing a joke on me because at the time when I would speak to Catholics, it would be very much so the sense of, oh yeah, your faith is wrong, here's why, insert 40 ad hominem arguments and a couple straw mans. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, that, that would have, I would have laughed, you know, pretty loudly if someone told me that. All right, well, let's, let's, let's talk about how, um, how you began, you know, opening yourself up to Catholicism. I mean, you, you guys are studying the scriptures. What was the first domino that fell where you were like, oh, wow, that's something like the Catholic Church, or this is an objection I've had towards the Catholic Church, which I guess I don't have anymore. Somebody, somebody help us lead through that, uh, get through that. Yeah, sure. So um, for me, anyway, the central issue um, for all theology is soteriology. How is a man saved? How is a man brought into right relationship with God? And if anyone grows up either, either in the Calvinist or fundamentalist world, they're very much so going to be taught, like, you must be born again. You must be born again, which is true. It's just John chapter 3. Unless a man be born again, he shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so from a young age, I was taught um, kind of just the really popular American gospel, just pray a prayer, and then you're good to go for the rest of your life. It doesn't matter what sins you commit. God has forgiven your past, present, and future sins. And so while I was, the, while I was a pretty Calvinist, um, this idea of you have to be an elect was very present in my mind. But when I went to the scriptures, and, and I can share a few if you'd like, um, when I went to the scriptures, I recognized that the scriptures, so it's true, when a man meets Christ, it's not just that he prays a prayer and then he lives however he wants to. A man meets the person of Christ, and he is fundamentally changed. If a man meets God, he's going to be changed one way or the other. And so when I started doing this, looking at the scriptures, I noticed that the scriptures very much so clearly teach that when a man meets God, he either um, falls away completely, rejects him, or he, he chooses him. But where I got mixed up, and this is how I started really studying what the Catholic Church started to believe, is that when I read through 1 John, as an example, I saw that they it clearly talked about signs of salvation, signs that you knew that you were born again. And I would compare my life with them, and I recognized very quickly, I do not know the Lord. And so just to give a couple brief ones, uh, in the book of 1 John, in chapter 1, it says in verse 3, uh, the apostle tells us that that which we have seen and heard, which we declare unto you, and that, that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship may be with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so the apostle very much wants us to have fellowship with God. But when we look at verse 6, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is also is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. And so I asked myself, do I walk in the light as he is in the light? Not just attempting to walk in the light, as I saw it at the time, but do I walk in the light as God is in the light? That seems like a very high degree of holiness. Um, I also saw that in chapter 2, in verse 3, it says this, And by this we know that we have known him, if we keep his commandments. And I asked myself, do I truly keep his commandments? Because if you look down in verse 6 of First John chapter 2, it says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. And that was the verse that really convinced me. I, I clearly do not know the Lord because I don't know anyone who walks like Christ walked with that degree of holiness. And so looking at it from the Calvinist perspective, either I'm going to have this born again experience where I'm just totally set free from all sin um, in, in, in almost a perfectionistic kind of way or else, um, yeah, I'm not going to be born again. I had no concept of the idea of that being a process. How how, uh, how do you think a, a Calvinist might respond to this? Because I, I doubt that 
a Calvinist would agree with your interpretation that if I come to know Jesus Christ, I will be completely sinless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, very much so. And you see, though, um, as a good example, the Calvinists that were I were reading at the time, most of these men were Puritans. And so they would use the language of, if you practice any form of sin, any type of known sin at all, know of assuredly that you do not know the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so it was very much so, for me anyway, I'm, I'm very much a person who, um, before the Lord freed me from it, struggled with scrupulosity. Mm-hmm. And so right. I asked myself, well, how then, there, if I practice any form of sin, does that include <laughs> bad thoughts? You know, does that include bad speech or bad intention? Because the Lord will judge me by those things, and unless I'm wiped clean from those things, could I be set free? And so, yeah, you. I think with Calvinists, you'd have a mixed bag. I think you'd have a lot of them who would say that um, it could be a process over time of walking in salvation. But if you go back and you read the early, early Puritans, they definitely use much firmer language of, okay. yeah, if you practice any form of sin, no, surely you're not born again. Uh, Sean, what what was something Mm -hmm. as you were going through this Bible study that that began to kind of open your eyes to Catholicism being less crazy than than you had originally thought? Yeah, so um, I had a more like, I guess, Zwingli interpretation. So like pretty much like no sacramentology, everything's a symbol and faith alone um, is like was like quite literally what it means faith alone. Uh, and so a few things opened me up was realizing like, uh, a man isn't just justified by faith alone. Um, like you see, uh, our Lord say, uh, in, in the gospels, like, uh, you'll be, you'll be justified by every word, idle and unidle, um, mm-hmm. or, or, uh, John, John three, five, just to, to give a simple example of, uh, mm-hmm. baptismal regeneration, where unless a man be born of the spirit and of water, he shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Um, And so those piqued my interest, but I still had a firm disposition of, of this being wrong. (laughs) Uh, But uh, uh, luckily for, for me, Nick is, is one of my best friends. And so uh, he just has this incessant pursuit of the truth. Uh, Whatever, whatever he feels is right. He will go, uh, headstrong into it, even if it just completely contradicts what he believes. And so me being stubborn in my beliefs, uh, Nick just asked me a simple question one day of what if Catholicism is true? Like, do you even have the door just cracked open just a little bit? And uh, I had to be honest with myself and I had to uh, realize my obstinacy and um, the belief of Catholicism. And so him asking me that simple question of what if it's just true just a little bit made me have to uh, actually take a real evaluation of uh, what the church teaches. Jack, uh, same question for you. What what was it that began to open your mind that Catholicism wasn't as nuts as you first had uh, perhaps thought? Yeah. um, So growing up, hearing a lot of things, especially here in the, you know, the Bible Belt, Texas, um, there's a lot that's talked about of the Catholic church that isn't really the Catholic church. Um, Oh, geez. I think it's uh, Venerable Fulton Sheen who has uh, the quote of, you know, not many people, maybe a hundred actually hate the Catholic church, but thousands of people hate what they think the Catholic church is. And I I was absolutely one of those people. Um, So as we really started learning, okay, well, if we're going to disprove something, we have to first know what they believe. As we started to learn what they believed, I started to realize, wow, okay, one, I believe a lot of straw men about the Catholic Mm. Church. Um, There's a lot of examples of things that are just not accurate, you know, like, for example, papal infallibility, I did not have the proper understanding of that, you know, it's, it was very much so me attacking, oh, so, you know, y'all are going to follow someone who you know thinks they know everything and gets to make all of the decisions on everything and if they change their mind willy-nilly they can just completely make up a new faith and you'll have to follow them because of this doctrine of of papal infallibility um which was a straw man belief you know and it's sad because uh many many people still believe that about the catholic church and it's not it's just not true um 
there are multiple others um, uh, that we can get into uh, later, but that was the first thing. And then realizing, man, my argument against the Catholic Church is largely ad hominem. It's attacking um, the the least practicing members right. who who don't, you know, arguably you you couldn't call them Catholic, or, or they just don't know the faith, right? But um, yeah, realizing those two things of wow, I don't actually understand what Catholicism is. I hate a ghost. <laughs> Uh, and then, two, my argument isn't is a logical fallacy, like ninety percent of it. Okay. Uh, did you all know any Catholics at the time? Were you speaking with you know knowledgeable Catholics at this point, where, when you're just now beginning to think of Catholicism, that you could run these things by? I'd say, um, unfortunately, in my experience, I only met with by the time I converted two truly practicing Catholics. Um, the Catholics that I knew growing up, they were the type of people who would, you know, get drunk on Saturday, stumble into confession, and then go to Mass the next day. And I'd be like, where's the freedom? You know, where's the walking in the light as he yeah. is in the light? Um, but there was one person in high school, uh, and I have permission to use his first name, uh, Brian, who uh, would not stop. He was, he was an upcoming apologist, and he would not stop. Could not, would to not. <laughs> I know, right. And so he would he was very fair with me. He would come back with specifically Bible verses. He wouldn't bring um because he knew I wouldn't accept it. He wouldn't bring a church document about X, Y, or Z. He would bring just the scriptures and he'd be like, Well, what do you think of this scripture or that scripture? And so it very much challenged me, um, to where, you know, I would be like, Dang, you know, I've read the scriptures many times, but I just don't don't think I read that one. I just don't remember it. Uh, and then the second person would be uh, whenever I was finally, when I finally got to the point of recognizing that, okay, salvation must be a process. It's 100% by God's grace, but it's not just an instantaneous cleansing from sin. It's a, it's a process. It's a relationship with the Lord. Um, when I, I got to that perspective and recognized that the Catholic faith taught that, uh, I had a friend who invited me to go to Mass with her. Her name's Maddie. And uh, when I went to Mass uh, that day, uh, you know, I, I kind of knew what the Mass was, um, you know, when to sit, when to stand, etc. cetera. Um, but the Gospel reading that day was the story of the prodigal son. And in that moment, you know, being, I guess, in the strictest sense, a revert, uh, since I was baptized as an infant, uh, I definitely felt like he was calling me. He was saying, okay, son, it's time to come home. And so it was through both of their witnesses that really inspired me to at least give it a chance. <clears throat> okay, so here's, here's a question. Like, I understand that you began to realize that salvation was a process and mm -hmm. not, as you put it, an instantaneous cleansing. I still don't know how you go from that directly to Catholicism. Like, I could see, you know, some dear Protestant brothers and sisters watching this on YouTube being like, dude, like, ha okay, like, there are so many other options you could have taken, but mm -hmm. you chose the one where you've got these the sacrifice of the mass and prayers to mary and purgatory and indulgences i guess mm -hmm. so I, i'm i'm still having i'm still having a tough time understanding how you went from your view of justification changing to catholicism yeah sure so so two things so i saw justification as becoming more and more of a process and you know james chapter 2 being very clear that you know salvation is not by faith alone um, but it is by you know faith and by works done through charity, as Galatians 5, 6 says. So that's one thing that convinced me, okay, at least the Catholics are right when it comes to some form of justification. Um, okay. But what convinced me of the other things were, is I, I'm, I'm a history major. And to me, I had to ask myself the stunning question of, um, why is my faith so young? Especially if I'm getting just interpretations from myself, why is my faith so new? And thinking, you know, if I was logically wanting to trace any type of belief system, I would want to go back to the sources and see if I could at least find a, a you know, a line of documentation going back to prove something. And so I was just like, okay, I keep hearing about these church fathers up on YouTube that everyone's talking about has converted them. So let me go and read them. Hmm. And so through reading this, the church fathers, I came to the realization of, should I not interpret scripture as the fathers interpreted, because I have a, a, a weird conundrum. Either one, I can continue my hardcore fundamentalist interpretation and say that you know all Catholics are not saved, and therefore I can say 
the guys who knew the Apostle John were, were heretics, and I'm right. Or I can look at myself and say, I'm the heretic, and they were right. And so it was going back and reading through their interpretations of the Bible that I was like, wow, they actually did not have a problem when it came to sacred imagery, as I previously you know, thought <laughs> sacred imagery mm-hmm. was evil. They did not have a problem when it came to the intercession of the saints. And look, they're pointing me to these passages of Scripture in Revelations where it's talking about like the saints receiving our prayers in heaven as, you know, as incense. And looking at these things, I'm recognizing, okay, I have a choice. I can either follow this pedigree that seems to be true. I mean, the fathers are literally calling themselves Catholic, or I can stay in my own perspective and, um, and okay. just rule everyone out, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. Sean or Jack, and maybe we, one of you can go first, and then we'll hear from the other. What was your experience? I presume you began also to read the early church fathers, and if so, what was it that you found in them that surprised you? Um, for me, whenever I started reading the the church fathers, uh, what was astounding to me was that the like mystical body of Christ wasn't just this. Uh, wasn't just an abstract like mystical body of Christ, but a physical place, um, and not just like, uh, not just something that was like, oh, okay, yeah, we have a church building that meets on Sundays, but uh, like a hierarchical um, bishop, priest, lay people relationship, uh, and so that made me want to inquire more about well, if if the early church is believing that there's this line to the apostles, uh, where, where does that line take us now? Okay. Jack. Yeah, totally. Um, I would say the most influential, uh, realization that I had, uh, was coming out of Exodus. Um, cause my biggest problem, it got to the point I could even, um, when it when it came down to it, and we were we were understanding the doctrines of the Catholic Church, uh, it, the last straw to fall for me was the papacy and being able to understand. Okay, this is something that is good and not just good, but instituted by Christ. Um, and so, I had a friend, actually a dear friend of all four of the people who started the Bible study. All four of us. Um, his name's Jonah. Um, he sat down with me and he was going through a book. I, I don't know if it, Nick or Sean, if you guys remember what book it was. Um, Jewish Roots of the Papacy. It, yeah. Yeah. He was going through Jewish Roots of the Papacy at the time. At the time. Jonah's a, a man that we met um, while being interested in Catholicism and starting to to learn about it. Uh, we met him at Olo, Our Lady of Wisdom here in San Marcos. Um, and he sat down with me and he was like, well, what are your questions about the papacy? I'm confused. Uh, where where do you not understand or why is it not something that you see as correct? Um, and we went together through um, Exodus with the institution of the priesthood of Aaron and the for that how that foreshadows, uh, you know, in I think it's Matthew 16, uh, the institution of the priesthood with Peter. Um, and there were so many just key realizations where uh, I think he, he asked me a specific question or he uh he made the this specific point of there needs to be a leader of the church because a problem for me was that you have thousands upon thousands of Protestant denominations, all who not maybe not all, but most who disagree fundamentally on how you are saved, and so that was a that's that was a huge red flag in Protestantism, and that's why uh, we were looking for the one church, and so having this idea of, oh, yes, there needs to be a leader of the church so that what happened in the Protestant church doesn't happen, where you just have disagreements and then schisms, um, because then truth merely becomes subjective to, you know, whatever that church believes the truth is, and you lose, you know, the historical continuity of the faith that Christ instituted through the apostles. And realizing that, it kind of... It was really a conversion at heart that happened, uh, understanding that, wow, it was this kind of just miraculous change in perspective where I just realized the necessity of the papacy and how important it is to the faith. I'd like to ask each of you to tell me what your biggest obstacle was to becoming Catholic, doctrinally, I mean, not relationally. What was your biggest doctrinal hang-up that you had to overcome before coming, 
before becoming Catholic? I'll give you like two minutes each to, to, to talk about that. Nick. Biggest doctrinal position was probably, um, I'd say, I'd honestly say the teaching on Mary was probably the hardest one for me. Um, mainly just because from, from an exterior perspective, when you see uh, the idea of like praying to anyone other than God himself uh, as a full, like full fledged worship, uh, that's how it's perceived. And so how I really overcame the issue when it came to Mary was other than just studying what the scripture said about her and seeing what the, you know, looking at the four dogmas of the church when it comes to our lady and comparing them with scripture, you know, I saw that there was truth in that, but there was always that personal hang up of like, I just feel very uncomfortable doing this. I, I just don't know if that's right or not. And um, for me, I actually, you know, praise God, I actually had an experience with Mary um, that forever changed my life. I was very much so like torn, is the Catholic faith the true faith? Because I see the scriptures testifying it. I see history testifying it, but my heart's not there. So intellectually I'm there, but everywhere else I'm not. And I remember one morning, um, you know, just being absolutely distraught about this. Whenever I got to the position that Catholicism could even be 1% true, I didn't eat for three days. I was just, I was oh, just wow. devastated at the fact that what I can okay, you, you, I'm sorry. You you got to you got to tell us. Oh, there. Sorry. You you got to tell us a little bit more about that, Nick. Uh, you said when you came to this point where you thought Catholicism might not be true, might be true. You didn't eat for three days. I didn't eat for three days. No. And, so and tell the reason us, being, uh, yeah, tell us about that. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. So the reason. Yeah. The I don't mean to laugh at your is, pain. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, it's all good. Uh, the reason being is that for me, truth is everything. Um, I will lose friends, I will lose family, I will lose a job, I will lose the shirt off my back if I can at least have the truth. Um, I have to know that I'm right. I have to know that I'm, that I'm correct when it comes to my place when, with the Lord. And so for me, growing up believing that the Catholic Church was the whore of Babylon, as depicted in Revelation 17, and that the Pope was the Antichrist, and that each Pope is merely just the continuation of an Antichrist system, when the place came that Catholicism could even be 1% correct, I was like, have I been telling people lies? Have I been abusing Christ's body for so long and just feeling so ashamed and just so torn that I just, the sight of food repulsed me. I couldn't do it. And so I would, I live on a, a beautiful piece of property. And so I would just wander around in the, in the woods, so to speak, like a sad sack, just being repulsed at myself and everything mm. it's been confused and how how mary delivered me from that was yeah i was so that, torn yeah. i was so torn um could this be true and could this not be true and, and this story some could say is somewhat subjective but I, you know this is just what happened um i was working one morning and it was it, i was working outside and it was it was dark and it was raining and i was just absolutely i felt like a hurricane was going on inside of me a hurricane of emotion and I, I thought, okay, if anyone knows if the Catholic Church is the true church, it has to be Mary, because that's the, that's the it has to be. And but in so order remember, to ask her, I have to accept, you know, intercession exactly. of the saints. <laughs> exactly. And so I, I just very much so was thinking in my mind, I have no clue what is going to happen. I have no clue if the Lord is going to damn me in this moment, but I am desperate. I need to ask for someone's prayers. And so I just said, you know, Mary, I don't Nick. know if you can hear me. Um, I don't know if uh, the Lord is going to be mad at me, but I don't know what to do. If Catholicism is the true faith, then you have to show me. And, you know, instantaneously, as I said that prayer, my heart was just baptized in peace to the point where my brain was telling me, it was trying to convince me, no, nothing's going on. You're experiencing something, but it's not Mary. But my heart was telling me, no, you've just experienced something. And uh, after that moment, I recognized, okay, I can either sear my conscience and say that this is not the true faith, or I can proceed forward and join the mm -hmm. church. Yeah, wow. Thank you so much for, for sharing that uh, with us. Sean, what was your biggest obstacle doctrinally that you had to overcome, and how did you overcome it? Um, my biggest one was probably the Eucharist, uh, because, uh, to put it bluntly, either 
Catholics are worshiping a piece of bread and we're all going to go to hell or Catholics are right and Protestants are denying the most beautiful thing Christ has ever given us. Um, and the way that like it was overcame was by Nick uh, persistently just asking me what John 6 was. Um, and I tried to uh, symbolically interpret John 6, uh, you know, like I think uh, I believe it's Zwingli. He goes he goes down a few more um, uh, verses, uh, kind of like just kind of skims through the bread of life discourse and goes, um, uh, man should not live on bread alone, but from the every word of the spirit of God. And he's like, see, uh, it, there, there's more to it. But uh, but mm -hmm. like. He's just kind of like you see a uh, symbol. Uh, no, Zwingli. And... Zwingli's pretty brutal when it comes to his anti-sacrament tology. Like in his work, mm -hmm. De Baptismo, it's it's quite stunning. I remember being like act legitimately shocked by it. That you know, like for example, you look at John three five. You cannot find a father that interprets it in a way contrary to baptism. You know. Mm -hmm. And Zwingli says, when it and it is in his work, he says, when it comes to baptismal regeneration, I can only conclude that all of the fathers and doctors have been in error. And you're like, really? <laughs> <laughs> at least, at least you're at least you're honest. At least you're consistent. Yeah. Whenever, whenever I was looking at the Reformation, because obviously that's like the place to go, I was just like, who's the most like vehemently opposed to Catholicism? And so he was the Reformationist that I took somewhat uh, kindly to, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, okay. I, I, um, was, I was reading John six, I was reading the church fathers. I, I was like, I, I had already come to the conclusion of like, of taking Paul's word literally, even as a symbol, when he says those who drink it, or eat and drink of the body and blood of Christ unworthily eat and drink damnation upon themselves as, as a symbol, I, I was like, yes, let me. Let me like make sure I prepare myself for this not sacrament a sacrament. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, uh, and so I, I honestly think I was just graced by like God one day to like realize realize the extreme the two extremes the two absurdums is this this is God giving us the most beautiful love story, or this is just merely a piece of bread. And hmm. for, between the scriptures the fathers, um, there wasn't any way to yeah. Uh, yeah. To to get past the Eucharist. Thanks, Sean. Jack, what about you? Sure. Yeah, I already got to talk a little bit about it. It was most certainly the papacy. Um, yeah. That was the largest and final domino uh, to fall for me. Um, but yeah, the the papacy was something I had a really hard time with because I was very much so a uh, only the priesthood of believers that you know. We don't need anyone else on earth to, you know, reach God. It's all internal, you know, and I would I would cite scripture verses of, you know, when you pray, go in your room and, and lock the door and pray to your God who's who's in heaven. And yeah, like it was it was just so difficult for me to accept uh, the possibility of it was really a pride and a very American disposition. Um, because here in America, it, it's very much so, I think we probably have a, a more prolific difficulty with the, the sin of ungodly self-reliance than, than most other countries. And that, that's a, a, a opinion, but, um, it's definitely something that we struggle with uh, as Americans and myself in included. It was kind of the essence of who I was. And so accepting any kind of leadership was was very very hard um and so that was underneath and motivating my argument against the papacy um realizing that and how that's just a terrible argument against the papacy because that's just my own issues with leadership then yeah it, it was it was a pretty swift domino to fall after i understood the foreshadowing of the institution of the priesthood in the old testament in exodus with the priesthood of Aaron. And then after I understood uh, the what the church fathers would say about uh, Matthew 16 and, and when Christ instituted the priesthood with Peter, um, because I would hear a lot of different modern interpretations, um, you know, the whole bit about, oh, well, if you go back in the Greek, I love, I love it when people say that, that always, everyone's a Greek scholar nowadays. Um, you know, people will say, oh, if you go back in the Greek, it means, 
um, small rock, not big cliff and yada yada. I'm not I'm not sure if you've heard that argument. Yes, but, of course. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. And so I would have a lot of these half baked, um, very uh, modern curated arguments against the papacy and to, to have one the realization that it's necessary after I realized that it's most certainly, you know, motivated my hatred towards the, the priesthood is motivated by my own sin and my own pride. It, it was a quick domino. To, it was a heavy domino to fall, but it was a quick one to fall. Okay. Um, well, thanks. Matt, I, yeah. Could we, sorry, uh, Jack, whenever he came to the conclusion of the papacy, he went to a focused Bible study the next day and had an experience oh. in adoration. And it's just, it's literally the most beautiful story. I think we'd be remiss not to, not to say it before. I would love, like, I would, lo yeah, I would love, on. I would love us to do that. I want to do one thing before we get to this story uh, of your experience in adoration. I'm excited about that. Um, and then after that, I'm going to ask the guys whether or not Pope Francis and the, the sort of sexual abuse uh, that's been prominent in the media over the last years was in any way uh, an obstacle for them to become Catholic. Before I do, I need to say thank you to Hallo. Uh, Hallo is an excellent app that will help you pray. It is 100% Catholic, and it's very well produced. You can, you know, check it out. Um, you can download it right now. Um, they've got sleep stories that lead you through different prayer experiences, like different Lexio Divinas, um, nightly examines and things like this. If you have trouble kind of keeping your brain like on track as you're trying to engage with daily prayer, you're going to love Hallo. Uh, there's a link in the description below. Go to hallow.com slash Frad right now. And it's free, right? The app is free. But if you sign up on their website using hallow.com slash Frad and use Frad in the promo code when you sign up, you can get three months free for every single thing on the app so you can try it out if you don't like it you obviously don't have to pay um, but go check it out because it is a really good app it's nice to see catholics making really great media so again h-a-l-l-o-w hallow.com slash mattfrad hallow.com slash mattfrad again that link is in the description below so be sure to go check that out yeah okay jack tell us about this experience in adoration sure um so my once the domino fell for the papacy um it was like a a really powerful chain reaction um because like nick said earlier i think we were all very much so it's just me and my bible um you know we haven't found the church that is god's church that the gates of hell will not prevail against uh, it must exist but we haven't found it and so until then it's just going to be me and my bible that was my disposition uh, and so I had never really been truly fed by a church. It was very much so just um, me hearing anything and going it, it making its way through every filter in my brain um, going, you know, is this good? What do I think about this? Is this true? Is this crap? Uh, does this person just want my money? Um, you know, what's what's going on here? And so it was a very, very skeptical perspective I had on anything anyone said. Um, and so to have this internal piece about understanding the necessity of the papacy, I was able to trust that, you know, the Catholic doctrine is true and that that truth persisted uh, in, you know, being true until now. And so I went to my first Catholic Bible study the next morning at, at 6 a.m. Um, and I, it, it was a it was a great Bible study. The the Bible study leader actually ended up being my confirmation sponsor, um, which is a, another good story. Um, I was sitting in that Bible study, and I just had this internal experience of not feeling as if I had to put my guard up, because I was listening to what he was saying, and I knew where he was coming from, because he was coming from the same place that I had been studying and reading about, you know, for the past I think it was seven months at this point. Um, and I saw the historical continuity with, you know, the points that he was trying to make. And I just realized that, wow, I can really let my guard down and experience the mystical body of Christ and experience being fed by a church, by an administration 
Um, and it, it brought me to tears in the middle of the Bible study. I had never felt, um, I'd never felt that before. And so to experience that within a church, it was like I had finally found what I was looking for. Um, and then immediately after that, after that Bible study, um, they had adoration at Our Lady of Wisdom, which is is so wonderful. They do that every single morning. Um, I sat in adoration because, I, you know, I coming off of that experience that I just had, I was I was 85 percent sure, you know, that, wow, yeah, this is. It was the, the chain reaction was happening and I could tell it was happening and I wasn't converted internally yet, but I knew that it was making its way from my head to my heart. Um, and so I sat down in adoration just in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament for a, a while. It, it felt maybe like 20 minutes. Um, do you all remember how long it was? It was like two hours. I think it was. It was insane yeah. time. It was it was something like that, but I was sitting in there for a good bit of time, and um, internally, I felt like I was literally being ripped in half um, because I had this past self that was so obstinate to the Catholic faith, and that held all of these, you know, anger, all of this anger and hatred and pain from the Catholic Church, um, and on the other half, I had this part of me that was understanding the beauty and being fed by the Catholic church and experiencing peace. And it was very, I was, I was brought to tears again in adoration and I am not the type of person who cries very often. You can ask the uh, knicker, Sean, uh, it, at that point, it was a very rare experience to see me cry. That's not the case anymore. I'm a big sob story now, but um, sitting in adoration for that time period, um, just fighting to be with God and not knowing which side of myself I was fighting against to, you know, escape sin. Um, I didn't have this, this experience until I got up. I, I was, I, I knew it was time to leave adoration. I got up, I left adoration and on my way out, I don't, I, I don't even remember leaving adoration. I just remember experiencing this internal uh, perspective on myself and on my situation where uh, on one hand I could you know remain obstinate and continue to say oh I have questions I just need to little, be a little bit more sure if I'm going to convert um, and on the other hand it was uh, God saying Jack I've shown you enough light it's time to either accept me or deny me because you know what the truth is um, and I remember ex experience that and with what I uh, would have argued retrobation was at the time, I was very scared of that experience because um, it felt as if, you know, it was choose me or, or, or deny me. But in that moment, I said, wow, yeah, I, I, it's been it's been a long time. What else is there for me to understand? I have no valid oppositions against the Catholic Church and it's not, you know, it's not good to just keep spouting ad hominem arguments, which uh, I guess we'll get to in a second. Um, yeah. But well, I chose Christ in that moment and immediately called my dad and told him that I was converting to Catholicism, who was he, he was the who was the one who brought me up very anti-Catholic. So um, I, yeah, that I want to I want to get to that in a second. Um, I want to thank you very much for sharing such a personal experience with us, Jack. Um, I want to get some questions from those who are watching. We've got over 500 people watching right now. And so I want to take their, their questions here in the sure. live stream. But I want to just ask each of you, maybe to try, try to be as brief uh, you know, as you can, um, you know, there's there's been a lot of scandal in the church. And I think uh, Catholics used to and perhaps still like point to the unity we have in opposition to our Protestant brothers and sisters. But really, there's a there's a lot of division within the Catholic Church. Um, Pope Francis has said things that at least at the very least seem really confusing and done things that do as well. Uh, you've got, you know, clerical abuse scandals popping up all over the place. Um, was how, how did this play in your con conversion to Catholicism? Did this yeah, how how was that in, in facing that and overcoming it, maybe? Yeah, sure. So for me, anyway, um, God graced me with, honestly, um, you know, much grace in just not looking, not not avoiding it intentionally, but 
um, being able to come to terms with the sex abuse scandals, recognizing the horrific evils that they are, but also trying to apply them to people versus to an institution. And um, the things, though, that really bugged me is what you just alluded to, which were the current pontificate's ambiguity in its language. And for me, this was about November of 2019, I believe it was, that I was considering becoming Catholic. As soon as I was starting to consider becoming Catholic, they had the, um, you know, the hotly mm -hmm. debated Amazonian Synod and just seeing for the first time Catholic news and the whole Pachamama incidents, I was completely scandalized because I was just like, man, I'm already struggling enough with the idea of sacred imagery, but it looks like you're clearly bowing down and worshiping idols. Um, and so it was, for me, it was a, it was a real struggle, but I had to recognize, okay, um, you know, Christ church will go through hard times and will go through abuses, but it's like, uh, I believe it's, uh, Pope Clement himself said in his uh, his epistle to the Corinthians, he said, to, to divide, to create schism, you do violence to the body of, of Christ. And so I recognize, you know, the church will go through hard times. It, you know, Christ says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. didn't say that the boat wouldn't get rocky. Um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, I was like, okay, if this is still the truth, this may be a very sucky situation, but I got to hold on tight. Yeah. Sean, what about you? Yeah, um, I wasn't necessarily, uh, I, I knew of the sex scandals, but the uh, Amazon, Amazonian Synod, I was uh, a little bit, I had my head in the ground, I guess, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but I realized that uh, with God, there could only be one truth pr that proceeds from that God. Um, and so with that objectivity, it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't wash one way or, or another. Um, there couldn't be relativity in this instance. Uh, and so through realizing that, I um, I decided to take people out of the equation um, because it's not wholly because of the, of the current uh, situation that the church might be going through, but it's wholly because it was uh, instituted uh, by Christ and produces uh, holy sacraments uh, and, and gives you the means to become a saint. And so um, I'd say that it definitely scandalized me. And that was a part of the strawman that I had to burn down for myself. Uh, but I knew at the end of the day, I had to look at it from an outsider's perspective and not from what was currently happening. Jack? Yeah, sure. I think um, Sean and Nick will both agree that I, I don't think it was as much as the church in the modern day that converted us as it was the church as seen in the perspective of looking at, you know, from now all the way back to when when Christ instituted uh, the church through Peter and the apostles. Um, and so initially looking at the church in the modern day this was the reason we all had written off the catholic church um and uh, you know on one hand you can't judge a faith by the worst practices of the least practicing members um but when it comes to uh, you know um different priests and people who are supposed to be leaders in the faith um yeah it's heartbreaking it's absolutely heartbreaking and it was a serious problem and it was a, a large portion of why I had uh, such an obstinacy towards the priesthood. Um, that being said, no, it, you, know, not, in, you go. Uh, yeah, it's, it's internally uh, a struggle for, for each Catholic to see one schism, not, not schism, but just opposition between members within the church. Um, and then two, just to, to see different, different things that the church does wrong, but it's really easy to be um, someone who points out all of the errors in someone else. Um, and, and it's hard to see the good. And so like Sean was saying, once you take uh, the argument of, oh, uh, the argument of attacking the church based on uh, errors of people and people who are sinful, um, and you look at the dogma and the truth you're really arguing about, you're talking about two completely different arguments, you know, and if, if you're going to convert to Catholicism, uh, 
you need to understand the dogma and the truth. And that's, that's probably, and so regardless of uh, the church and, and what it's doing, or maybe um, some examples of, of bad practices, right. Um, that's not church dogma. And that's not what the church is. That's, mm. you know, a, a, a difficult thing that's happening, but that's also being dealt with in the church. And so no church is without sin and without error uh, within its members. But when right. you get into Catholic dogma, and the teachings of the faith, uh, just I, I think all of us can personally attest that, you know, it's like that analogy I gave when we were all in a Protestant church, and it felt as if everyone was at this nebulous location, and uh, we all were supposed to pretend like we were there, and no one had the gas to put in the car to get mm. there. Um, in reality, the Catholic Church has the gas. Through the sacraments, we are infused with grace, and yeah, just I, I, there's, I, uh, I, I just go, got to say, I, I loved Nick when I asked you that question about like how you dealt with modern scandals. You know, to your point, Jack, you know, Nick points to Clement. So it's it is, you know, I mean, um, Cardinal John Henry Newman, I, he perhaps meant this, of course, in a different sense. But to be deep in history, not only is it to cease to be Protestant, but it's also it'll also enable you to make sense of the scandals um, and the abuses within the church today, because at the end of the day, like you're not going to find a communion of Christians in which there isn't abuses. I mean, when when you have a church as big as the Catholic Church, it's it's all the more easy to find them, of course. But you know, God rest him. But you know, Ravi Zacharias and the scandal that just came out regarding him, I think, is just one among many examples we could point to that would put to bed this idea that celibacy is somehow uh, something that um, you know leads to 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 abusing people and things like this you know um yeah. all right look we, we i want to get to, to some questions this is this is so fantastic also i want to say thanks to everybody who's watching we have 328 thumbs up here's the deal if we get 1000 thumbs up before tonight i will send each of these men a pints with aquinas beer stein don't you want them to be happy yes so click that <laughs> thumbs up button um and then also before we get into these questions i gotta let you know that um a couple of friends of mine uh, and myself have founded a new apostolate called Cross the Tiber, Ben and Noah. As you can see down here, they're often in the chat. In fact, Ben's here today. This is a, this is a great place if you are a Protestant considering Catholicism. As soon as you join, we will put you into a small video chat, a small group video chat. And you and several other Protestants and a Catholic who is faithful to the teachings of the Magisterium will help answer your questions. And um, it's 100% free. You know, so we're not trying to make money from this. It's just so that you guys can have some guidance. So go check it out. It's a kind of non-judgmental place where you can ask questions. And uh, yeah, crossthetiber.com. Crossthetiber.com. Go, go check it out. There's a link in the description below. All right. Let's 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 see here what we've got. Um, man, lots of people asking questions. We've got almost like 600 people. So my goodness gracious, let's see what we got. Okay, Francophone, thanks for the super chat. He says, "How did your people react to your conversions?" Yeah, so talk talk to us a little bit about your family uh, and your friends. How do they react? Uh, let maybe just go one at a time. Obviously. <laughs> sure. So to give you so to give you an idea. There was a scale that we made uh, of how people would react to when we told them we were becoming Catholic. One was the indifferentist, they didn't care. And then 10 was Martin Luther. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, honestly, I was very nervous telling my parents, um, I, you know, because I didn't know how they react. I knew that my parents definitely didn't necessarily like the church, but I had definitely had comments over the years that were very much anti Catholic. And so, when I phoned my parents, they were actually in Rome of all places, and uh, when I told them, uh, they very much so understood my reasonings, my, mainly the intellectual reasonings. Uh, they weren't necessarily thrilled or happy, um, but they chose to, tr they, they basically said, you know, at the end of the day, as long as you're serving Christ, you know, that's good for us. And, I, and since then, it's been very good because um, they've definitely warmed up to me um, trying to present my faith to them, um, even to the point of coming to, to Mass with me, which has been a, a huge blessing. And so overall, I've been very, very uh, blessed and graced to have a great reaction. Sean or Jack, you want to respond? Uh, yeah, 
whenever um, my parents found out, they were not the they were probably the same boat as as, as Nick. They were worried that um, I had jumped the gun. It was uh, like a very like quick thing. They like presented with me a bunch of straw men. Um, but as uh, as we like begin to build up like dialogue and stuff, uh, they've they've realized it's more. It, it there's more grounds uh to to my conversion than just uh oh all my friends were doing it <laughs> and uh they also are um uh, not the most thrilled but the same boat as, as as nick they're like as long as they're serving god jack sure uh between my my family there were two polar opposite reactions so my mother and my sister could not have been more excited for me just to be happy about something. Um, so they were infinitely supportive of me, my mother and my sister. They uh, they always have seemed to have my back in any situation. It doesn't really seem what the context is. In total opposition to that, uh, my dad could not accept it. Um, this was something that he, what he saw as a fundamental separation uh, from us that inhibited us to have a relationship. Um, and so I think he still struggles with seeing it to that to that direction. It's hard. I very much so see two people in my dad on one hand, um, his bringing up of having such animosity um, and hatred towards the Catholic Church. And on the other hand, the fact that, you know, he's my father and he loves me and I know that he loves me um, despite his hatred for what I believe in the church that I'm a part of. So when I called him, he was he was very, very upset. Uh, that I had made the decision to become Catholic. Um, I think it was out of the blue for him, uh, despite our, our, us having uh, constant debates about it. It was something that came up every single time we talked on the phone, the fact that I was, you know, reading about Catholicism and the history of Catholicism. And um, that was that was problematic. That was problematic for him. Um, however, yeah, he had initially a very poor reaction. Um, months later, he was more so able to accept the fact that we are different, uh, but he very much so would explain my conversion as uh, the manifested problem from what he saw his like his failures as a father in my life. Oh, and so, um, That's I think I, yeah, I, it's a it's a very tough thing that he's he's uh, he's dealing with, and and uh, it's it's only gotten worse since my uh, recent application to seminary. So, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we didn't even touch upon that yet. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, oh, God, God bless him. You know, I mean, for those who are watching who might be unsympathetic, you know, to how your dad reacted, you just have to ask, you know, I just asked myself the question, like imagine if my son called up one day and said he was becoming a Mormon, you know, like, would I be like, that's great, son? No, like if I thought Mormonism was false, you better believe I'd be upset about that and I'd do whatever I could to help him see the light. And that's that's a place your dad's in. And, you know, the fact he's Absolutely. he's he's hurt by this because he loves you, because he cares about you. Like if if some other random Protestant becomes Catholic, he might shrug his shoulders, but but not care, of course, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. God bless him. All right. Oh, here's a question. And you don't all have to answer because we do have a lot of questions coming in. You can if you want, but let's try to keep it relatively short. This comes from Mango Bango. Great name. <laughs> have you guys looked into orthodoxy? If so, why Catholicism and not orthodoxy? Yeah. So for me, I looked into orthodoxy a little bit um, because anyone who reads the fathers is going to see the the insane similarity between the two faiths. Um, but for me, the idea uh, in the four signs of the church, the idea of it being Catholic in the sense of it being universal, I did not see being played out as well in the Orthodox Church as I did in the Catholic Church. And that the small example would be the fact, uh, two things. One, the fact that all of the churches seem to be based on some form of a nationality, so Russian Orthodox, Antiochian Rite, etc. Um, and so for me, I just I just thought it would be weird for you know someone from Texas just to kind of walk into a, a Greek Orthodox church that was mainly focused on Greeks. And so for me, I was just like that seems doesn't seem to encapsulate the universality of the church as well as the Catholic Church. And then the second thing being, um, at the end of the day, 
as someone who just needs to know and wants to know the truth. With the Orthodox Church's current problem on them trying to figure out uh, through internal debates things like, is contraception a sin? Is divorce and remarriage a sin? Um, questions like that. For me, I was just, it, it seemed too ambiguous. And so for me, that was very much so a, a turning point where I recognized, okay, well, I need an ancient faith. And so the Catholic Church, it has answers. Catholic Church, it's for all people in a more visible way. Therefore, it makes more logical sense to follow that. Sean or Jack? Uh, pretty much the same boat as uh, Nick. I just add to the fact, like, I I feel the almost necessity of a monarchical of like of like a monarchical a monarchical rule mm -hmm. in the church, <laughs> uh, because uh, like I if all four of us are bishops and we all and we all disagree, who who has the say that like like me and Jack agree and then and then you you and Nick agree. Who has the say to uh, come and, and dispute it? And obviously, they'd say that like uh, there's there's higher premises of bishops, but at some point, somebody has to give the final rule on faith and morals. And so, um, just that third stool of of the mm. of the magisterium uh, is what attracted me. Thanks, Jack. Yeah. Did you want to add something? Sure, just a, a little thing. We actually have a good friend um, who comes to our Bible study and, and comes to Mass with us um, who's converting from Protestantism. Uh, I think Nick was the first to meet him. He walked into Our Lady of Wisdom, uh, and he, I, th I think so, Nick introduced himself, and he said, Hi, I'm, I'm Jacob. I'm, I'm looking for the, uh, the Apostolic Church. Um, hmm. And he said, Oh, well, you've come to the right place. Who, who did he uh, say I, that to? Nick. Oh, little did he know who he was saying that to. <laughs> Nick was, Nick, I could see Nick, Nick looking over this man's shoulder and saying to somebody out of sight, lock the doors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds Very exactly much. like something. Would say. <laughs> um, but yeah, just on his own, his own uh, testament to, to, I'll just state one point. Uh, I don't, this is the only thing I really have to add. What's already been said is that, uh, he very much so wanted to experience both of the churches. Um, and so he would go to a, a Catholic church one Sunday and an Orthodox church one another Sunday. Um, and on one hand, it's extremely hard to actually find an Orthodox church close to him. Um, sure. When he goes to that Orthodox church, there's a very small amount of people. Um, it's not, you know, I think he said maybe there were 50 people there or so um, for like the primary service on Sunday. Um, and to be fair, all of them were adamant about their faith, which is so wonderful. Um, but just like Nick was saying, it doesn't have the universality um, because it was a, I think it was a Russian Orthodox church. And so it was very much so uh, upon his description saying they felt, he felt as if when, when people looked at him or he wasn't very welcomed, they were more so, oh, why are you, why are you here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Decluse Views, by the way, this guy's got a fantastic YouTube channel, which I highly recommend. And uh, uh, would you know, go check it out. But he said, uh, do any of these fellows have experience with Eastern rites and or the traditional Latin mass before or after their conversions? Oh, oh, do we? Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, Lock the during doors. during November of 2019, during the uh, the whole incidents with the uh, the Pachamama scandals, it very much threw me off and being like, should I even convert or not? And so, I was going to a, a local Novus Ordo parish at the time, and um, I had been, you know, as kind of the nerd of the group, heavily reading the like the Council of Trent, trying to understand like, okay, I just want like very clear Catholic teaching in the face of Protestantism historically. So I'm just reading this, and then I. I go to um, a Nova Sordo parish, and um, you know, obviously not every Nova Sordo parish is like this, but I was just very confused at what I saw, uh, things along the lines of guitars and drums being used during Mass, and people going up to the communion line in sports jerseys, and for me, I was thinking, you know, aesthetically, if you, you know, you know I know doctrinally you believe this is God, but aesthetically, I, I don't see it, and so I questioned for a long time based off of the aesthetics alone, like, is this true? Because these guys don't act like this is the Lord at all. Um, and so for me, I, I, uh, I knew about the traditional mass and I decided one, uh, it was on All Souls Day to, to go 
to an early requiem mass at like 7.30 in the morning. It was a, it was a sung mass, and um, I sat in the very back pew because I was like, I don't know what's going to happen, and I don't want to be embarrassed or anything. And so uh, whenever the, uh, the intro had started, I literally thought this has to be a recording. The scola can't be this good. And I, I witnessed um, through the Mass everything that I was reading about in the faith just come to life very much so. And so it was very much the traditional Mass that converted me um, and, and is what kept me in the faith. And so all three of us regularly attend on Sundays up uh, in Austin, St. Mary's Cathedral um, for the Latin Mass. Yeah, all right. Uh, we have a, pay, a question over at patreon.com slash Matt Frad. Thanks for being a patron, uh, Adam. Uh, have, Adam says, have you had to explain to your Christian families that they can't receive the Eucharist? And if so, how did you do that in a charitable way? Hmm. Sean or Jack? Okay, I know the answer... Jack, your 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 mom's been to mass. Sean, has any of your parents been to mass with you? Yeah. Yeah, my 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 uh, dad had Catholic friends back in college, and so he knew better than uh, to oh, receive. Well, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I just told my parents very quickly, and they they accepted it with charity. Yeah. Um. For me, my mom and sister have both come with me to mass, and um, I don't think it was something that you know it, when first of all, as a Protestant, when you go into a Catholic mass it's kind of intimidating because there's a lot of uh things that everyone knows to do that they don't know what to do and so there's this air of i have no idea what's going on and so oftentimes in my experience bringing someone who is protestant to mass they're looking for someone i.e you who brought them um to tell them what to do and inform them on how they should act because most people if they're willing to come to a mass they want to be you know, understanding and, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, of the culture and not go against the grain. And so um, I've never had an experience where it's been someone's, you know, been told that they could uh, that they couldn't receive the Eucharist and they've been uh, offended. Um, however, as long as you stress uh, what the Eucharist is and mm-hmm. why they can't receive it, then I, I think, yeah, I think you're, you're good to go. Yeah, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of a Protestant or non-Catholic uh, approaching Holy Communion. I, I think it's like, you know, you're out of your comfort zone. You're, you're going to this thing. Uh, you hope that you'll be welcomed. You hope that nobody's going to corner you and you know tell you going to hell or something like that. So I think you're already kind of coming and you're a little anxious about the experience. And to be told that you must refrain from this thing, I can understand uh, why somebody would be put out by that. I think telling them, look, this is for Catholics who are in a, in a state of grace. And so it, not only are we asking Protestants and non-Catholics to refrain, we're also asking Catholics to refrain who don't <laughs> think they're in a state of grace. And um, yeah, I, th- I think uh, most Protestants would, like just, just like if I was going to a Protestant church, I would want to know like what are the rules because obviously I don't want to offend anybody. I think that that that's probably how I'd take it. Hey, funny story, Nick, because you said maybe you come from a fundamentalist Baptist background. I was I was in uh, where was I? Um, but Baltimore, I think it was in Baltimore at an independent fundamentalist Baptist church, and it was unreal, man. They 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 handed out chick tracks as we entered, um, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it was something else, man, and I appreciated their zeal uh, and their lack of drums. Uh, but afterwards, we, we went out to this pancake place, right? And I said to my friend, who was an independent fundamentalist Baptist, I said, "So who's in like who's what's like who's in charge?" And they went, "Well, no one's in charge. Like really, we are a brotherhood." And, and I'm like, "Okay, cool." But who's in charge? And she's like, "That guy." <laughs> like, you can't get away from that darn hierarchy, can you? No, it's the man of God. You got to listen to him. Yeah. Um, hey, here's a question. You guys were part of a Bible study that included more than just the four of you you referenced earlier, that the, the mm-hmm. man who's not with us today, who also became Catholic. Uh, how did they take your conversion to Catholicism? Um, yeah, so, um, it, you know, from the beginning, it was it was definitely us four, and there was two or three people that would kind of hang around with us at the beginning. And when we initially started... So the way our Bible study is formatted, it's very much so I'll present a lecture and, um, you know, afterward we'll discuss it a little bit. And I, as I was getting closer to Catholicism, would kind of start to test the water, so to speak, just to see how they would react. And so, um, you know, I would talk about like the 
more central ideas of the Trinity and a more doctrinal uh, understanding. And then I would throw out baptismal regeneration. And for the most part, um, people took it well. It was really people outside of our Bible studies that um, who had never gone that really started to um, at least be somewhat um, – have animosity towards what we were teaching. And so for a time, um, even though we weren't teaching explicit Catholic truths or even had been totally convinced of the Catholic truths themselves, we definitely for a time had the, uh, for lack of better terms, the hierarchy of our old church telling people to stay away from what we were doing. And so um, unfortunately, everyone that was kind of there in the beginning of the Bible study dried up and, and packed up and left. And so it was just us that remained. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Um. So you know, we we we've talked about how different dominoes began to fall. Um. It sounded like each of you had different hang-ups that were preventing you from wanting to become Catholic. Obviously, there were multiple, but you've you've talked about the Eucharist. You've talked about Mary. You've talked about the papacy. Uh. When I mean, was it was it something like the three of you or the four of you got together and were like, okay, I guess we're all going to do this, or were some of you further along the road to Catholicism than others? How did how did that work? Um, very cool if I take it. Yeah, go right. for it. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, Nick, Nick was probably the first one to be convinced, um, just because he was very principalist in his, in his views. Uh, and so he was being belligerent to me, uh, and, and around the time that he was being belligerent, uh, I had to come up with, with answers for his answers, which then came back Catholic. Uh, in which then we went and <laughs> became belligerent to Jack, <laughs> and, then, nice. and then and then all three of us were belligerent to Kason. Jack, who mistakenly thought that God was proud of him, jerk. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's still kind of how Nick and I's relationship is. It's pretty good. <laughs> no much pain. Let's just hope that Nick marries a woman with a good self-esteem or becomes a priest. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Um, so I just want to remind everybody, we have 476 likes. If we get a thousand thumbs up, I'm going to send this Pints with Aquinas beer stein to these guys. Uh, and I also want to encourage people who are watching right now to consider becoming a patron. This is the only way you get this... Uh, Pints with Aquinas Beer Stein. I'll also send you a copy of my book. You get stickers. You know, all this work, believe it or not, does cost money. Um, we put about $30,000 into the new studio, into the lights, the cameras. I'm paying people to fly out to be on the show and things like this. And so it would mean the world to me if you're enjoying this content. Go over to patreon.com slash mattfrad. There's a link in the description below. Give 5 10 20 bucks a month. Um, and you'll join this amazingly vibrant community of other Catholics all around the world. We do all sorts of studies, uh, you know, on Thomas Aquinas and other things. And yeah, it would, be, it would really mean a lot. Pintswithaquinas.com. Uh, you can give to me there. I'll just go to patreon.com slash Matt Frad. All right, guys. Well, what else, uh, what else should we maybe touch upon before we begin to wrap up? Um, oh, the, the nail in the coffin for me. Uh, I really like to share this one. The nail in the coffin for me uh, w was uh, my experience with Mary at Mass. So the so the readings I, we we had them a few weeks back, or uh, in Luke chapter two, whenever uh, she's presenting Jesus in the temple, and the uh, and the prophet comes up to her and says that you will be pierced with the sword. And so the subsequent homily was over how Mary suffered during the Passion, and it was in that time that Mary had just, I guess, like gave me a, an abundance of grace. And I started to, uh, to weep uh, just mm. of how beautiful she was because it clicked in my head that the, um, like outside of like uh, agape love, like God's love on this earth, all we have is uh, familial love. And the strongest love within that familial love is a mother and her son. Um, knowing that um, and realizing that it's a Christological heresy to not um, know the two wills of Christ at all times are present within uh, the hypostatic union, that Mary could not have loved God, or, uh, yeah, could not have loved God and only loved her, the, the person 
of Jesus Christ. Um, and so between first John, he who, who loves light is in the light and cannot walk in darkness. Um, knowing that, uh, when, uh, the angel appeared to Mary, uh, hail Mary full of grace or, uh, uh, or to uh, me uh, off of off of Jack as a Greek scholar, you know, uh, Kikiri Tomine, uh, just being uh, the best uh, uh, translation being full of grace, uh, really hit me. And and realizing that Mary, by her, by her office of being the mother of God, it wouldn't have been befitting that she would have ever been a slave to sin, because she was to to hold or to for the heavens that could not contain one womb bare, you know. Hmm. And and uh, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, a- after mass, I was like, I was like, I like, cleaned myself up, like was like <laughs> was finishing prayer. I told my I told uh, one of my friends who was Catholic, and he was like, "Well, Mary's got you, so I, I think you have to convert now." <laughs> What was it like uh, learning to pray the rosary? Do you pray the rosary, and what was that like? Oh, you got to pray the rosary. <laughs> um, uh, learning to learning to pray the rosary was uh, was very was very beautiful because um, I I don't think I've I I would I, I never really did any any lexios as uh, as a Protestant and learning to just like truly know what it means to meditate over and over and over again on just one uh part of the bible or or the mysteries of of, of the of the gospel it's uh been truly beautiful my 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 favorite thing was uh learning the, the rosary in latin um because uh we had we had made a deal to learn it in latin and just one one day everybody else had learned it and I was like, well, we still do it in English sometimes. And Jack decided to just only do it in Latin. And so that had pushed me to to finally make the jump. <laughs> Very good. Well, brothers, it is a pleasure to hear from you. Um, Jack, all the best with uh, entering seminary and Nick and Sean. Thank you so much. Well, welcome to the church. Everything is on fire. It's great to have you. Uh, I'm joking, of course, but uh, it, it's it's really lovely to have you. Um, do you all post or write or podcast anywhere that people should be aware of? This is where we plug the Thomistic Institute. Um, yes, do uh, it. All three, do it. <laughs> all three of us are part of the Thomistic Institute. I'm the president. Uh, Nick is a uh, is a vice president, and uh, Jack's a part of it <laughs> at, here at Texas State. Um, do you uh, make people and, call you Mr. President? Because I would. I mean. I hope so. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, and so, and so, yeah. I think that it's a it's a great place to learn um, the uh, Catholic uh, intellectual tradition. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I would say, yeah. If you're in the if you're in the you know San Marcos Hayes County area, definitely check us out at Texas State. Um, also, there's a wonderful chapter that's up at UT. Um, if you're up in more in the Austin area, definitely check them out. All right. God bless you, brothers. Thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, yeah, hope we bump into each other again. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. Bye.